So the next question we want to consider is what happens when two waves meet while traveling through the same medium? And so let's start by thinking about identical waves. So what I've got here is a graph that's showing me two waves that I've labeled wave one. Wave one is blue, wave two is red. And you can see from their equations that they're identical with one exception. So they have the same amplitude, same angular frequency, same angular wave number, but they have different phases. And so what we want to do is we want to say, well, what happens as we change what's going on with phases of wave one and wave two? So what we'll do is we'll change the phase of wave two and see what we get when we add these two waves together to create what's known as a resultant wave. So for starters, let's start with these two waves perfectly lined up. So you can see that wave one is effectively disappeared because it lies behind wave two. So there it is. So this is a case where wave one and wave two are perfectly lined up. The peaks of wave one sit at exactly the same point as the peaks of wave two. The troughs of wave one are at exactly the same place as the troughs of wave two. Here's a situation where waves one and two, their phase is identical. Well, this purple wave is the resultant. It's what we're going to get when we add together wave one and wave two. And what you notice is that when my waves are perfectly lined up like they are here, I get a resultant wave that has exactly the same wavelength. The peak-to-peak -peak distance is the same for the resultant wave as it is for both wave 1 and wave 2, but the amplitude is different. And in fact, in this case, the amplitude is twice the amplitude of the individual waves. So wave 1 and 2 each have an amplitude of one unit. The resultant wave has an amplitude of two units. So this was the scenario when wave one and wave two had a phase that was identical. But what happens when we start letting the phase of phase two differ from the phase of phase one? And so what you'll see is those two waves start shifting apart. So as I let that phase change and keep the phase of phase one the same, but increase the phase of phase two, those waves start to shift relative to each other. And the interesting thing is, the more they shift away from each other, the smaller the resultant wave gets. And so as I keep shifting them, the resultant wave gets smaller and smaller. And at some point, what you notice is, instead of adding together to give me a larger wave than the two individual waves, I cross over the point where they're the same height, and then I end up with a resultant wave whose amplitude is smaller than the individual waves. This keeps happening up until the point where the resultant wave disappears. And so if I think about what's going on in the moment where the resultant wave disappears, well now the peak of wave one sits at the trough of wave two. So the peak of one wave lines up with the trough of the other. And that's true at each of these points. We get our resultant wave by adding together this much of wave one plus the amount of wave two in the same position. And what you see is that because whatever the value of wave one is, whatever its amplitude is at that point, wave two has the same amplitude, but it's on the other side of the center line for our wave. And so when I take something that is whatever the value is and positive and add it to something that's the, exactly the same value but negative, I get zero. And so I get zero all the way across the wave here. They've completely canceled out. Well, if I continue to shift phase two, so keep increasing it, that resultant starts coming back. And of course, at some point, it gets to the point where I've shifted wave two far enough away from wave one now that I end up with a resultant wave that's starting to be bigger. So instead of, you can think of this as we took this peak of wave two and initially it was lined up with this peak of wave one and we've shifted it so far the peak of wave two is actually starting to line up with the next peak of wave one. 
And so you're starting to see a resultant wave that builds up and gives us something that's larger than the individual waves. And again, that the amplitude of the resultant wave keeps increasing until I get all the way to where my waves perfectly line up again. Peaks lie along peaks, and I end up with a wave, a resultant wave, whose amplitude is twice the amplitude of the individual waves. This process is known as wave interference. It's the phenomena that happens when you let two waves interact with each other. And what wave interference cares about is the phase difference between your two waves. Now what we saw is there were some special cases where particular values of the phase difference result in either twice the amplitude of the wave or no wave at all. And the special case where we ended up with twice the amplitude for the resultant wave is called constructive interference. And so these situations happened when the phase difference between the wave was zero, so the initial point where they perfectly lined up, or when we had shifted one wave by a full 2 pi relative to the other. If we kept going, we'd get constructive interference when we shifted by 4 pi, by 6 pi, by 8 pi, by 10 pi, by 12 pi. So what you'll notice is that when the phase difference between your two waves is some integer value times 2 pi, whether that's 0, 1, 2, 3, pick whatever energy you want, but when it's an integer value times 2 pi for the phase difference, you have constructive interference and the amplitude of your resultant wave is twice the amplitude of your individual waves. The other special point we saw where the two waves perfectly canceled out. The one we saw was when that phase difference was pi. So one way to think about it is that it was the midway point between the two instances where the waves were perfectly lined up and gave me constructive interference. And the first time that happened was at zero, phase difference of zero. The second time that happened was at a phase difference of two pi. So the midpoint of that is clearly pi. Well, it happens again at three pi, then five pi, if even integers times pi gives us constructive interference, odd integers times pi gives us destructive interference. Destructive interference says that your two waves completely cancel out and so your, your resultant wave disappears. Well, we also saw that there were a whole lot of intermediate values. And so those result in what are known as intermediate interference. The easiest way to think about intermediate interference is it's all the points where you don't have either constructive interference or destructive interference. We can calculate out and say, well, if the phase difference between my two waves was, say, pi over 4 radians, then the amplitude of my resultant wave ends up being 1.85 times the amplitude of the individual waves. If that phase difference was pi over 3, then the amplitude is 1.73 times the amplitude. And so what you notice is that as you slide farther away from 0, a phase difference of 0, towards a phase difference of pi, the amplitude gets smaller. Once you go past pi and start getting closer and closer to 2 pi, then the amplitude gets bigger again. So where our points of constructive and destructive interference sit in terms of this table that we've set up is our first point of constructive interference at a phase difference of zero sits up here at the top. The next point of constructive interference for a phase difference of two pi sits down here at the bottom. Our point of destructive interference where, a phase dif where the phase difference between our two waves is pi sits right here in the middle. And so the amplitude decreases for our resultant wave as you slide from a phase difference of 0 towards a phase difference of pi, crosses that 0, and then starts to grow again as you slide from pi towards a phase difference of 2 pi. Well, what happens if we don't have identical waves? And so here we still have wave 1, but now we've changed wave 2, and you can see that Wave 1 has a different amplitude than wave 2. Waves 1 and 2 have different wavelengths now. 
Our waves aren't identical, but wave interference still occurs. It simply gives us a pattern that ends up being much more complicated. And so we won't spend too much time working with problems where we have waves that aren't identical. But just recognize that if you do have wave interference with two waves that aren't identical, you can get very complicated patterns, and in many ways complicated patterns that don't look like they're coming from waves. It, it's hard to see how some of these patterns repeat when you have non-identical waves that are interfering with each other. Just know that you, we could go through the process of calculating out what's going on at any particular point, even if we had different amplitudes, different wavelengths, different frequencies, we could still figure out what's going on with the resultant wave at, at any particular point along, along your plot.